Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nolan Watson, President and CEO of Sandstorm Gold Royalties. Um, for those of you who don't know what Sandstorm is or even what a streaming royalty company is, we're a, a publicly traded company in the New York Stock Exchange. And what our business is, is we go out to mines around the world that produce gold, whether they be gold mines or whether they be copper mines or, or other types of mines that happen to produce gold. And we buy a right to a percentage of their gold revenue and or we call that a royalty or we buy a stream which is the right to purchase at an artificially low number the gold that they produce as they mine the mines and so we've got these streams of gold and gold royalties coming in from mines all around the world sandstorm we've built a portfolio of 250 streams and royalties on mines around the world 40 of them are already operating up and running so we have a, a substantial amount of cash flow and uh, it's a really interesting way to invest in the gold space. You get a lot more return than investing just directly in gold, but you get a lot more safety than investing in gold mining companies because our portfolio is diversified and our contracts don't come with the same risk of operating a mine, such as increased operating costs and capital expenditure overruns and those types of things. So we really do think, and this is the, why the title slide it is a brighter way to invest in gold. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the streaming and royalty model and precious metals, it really was started many, many years ago in the royalty space with a company called Franco Nevada, which is one of the world's largest precious metal companies today. Um, but then the first world's first streaming company was a company called Leap Precious Metals, and I was their first employee and their chief financial officer for a number of years before I went out to start up Sandstorm uh, 14 years ago, and we've been building Sandstorm ever since. One of the things that I do think it's important to note is sort of like three key tenets of how we have constructed our portfolio at Sandstorm. We are gold focused first and foremost. We do have some other commodities. We have some silver. We have a little bit of copper. We're pretty bullish on copper prices and have a few bits of other, but really are gold focused and precious metals is the bulk of our revenue. We're very diversified. Like I said, we have 250 streams and royalties around the world now and 40 of which are producing and we've been very purposeful to ensure that we've diversified not just in types of mines uh, but types of partners but also types of countries and so we manage our political risk very well no one asks no one country is more than 14 percent of our political risk no one asset is more than 12 percent of our company's overall value or net asset value and then the third point, and this is a really, really important point, that if you do look at the streaming and royalty landscape, that, that you, you kind of understand this so you compare apples to apples if you look at our peers, is the mines underlying our streams and royalties are very high quality mines. Not all mines are created equal. Some barely make any money, some shut down, go bankrupt, and some operate for generations and make enormous amounts of money because it's higher grade ore that they're mining, and the miners just simply make more money because they have more revenue relative to their costs. And the length of the mine lives underlying our contracts are very, very long. In many cases, they're multi-decade or, or generational mines. So not only do we have lots of cash flow, and that cash flow is growing, it's from high quality mines that are very, very long life. And that really does separate us from some of our mid-tier peers in the streaming and royalty space. I'm just gonna walk through what our production looks like in terms of number of gold equivalent royalty or stream ounces. This is the production of what we've received and then sold in terms of number of ounces every year. You can see last year, 2022 was a record for us. We bought and sold or received royal royalties for 82,000 ounces of gold and gold's close to $2,000 an ounce. So you can see that's close to $160 million US in annual revenue. This year, we're expecting that to increase to 95,000 ounces. Um, it's worth noting that we made a billion dollars worth of acquisitions last year. So we're starting to see some increased production this year from that. But also we've got a number of assets that are in construction right now, being built by major multi-billion dollar mining companies. And if we make no more investments and acquire no more things, that our production is expected to continue to increase over the next few years up to 125,000 ounces a year. And again, you can, you can do the math that works out to about a quarter of a billion dollars a year, a US revenue at $2,000 gold. 
But what's more important than that is not just what the production gets to, it's how long it can stay high. And so, for example, we're guiding the market now that we can maintain over 110,000 ounces a year average for the next 15 years. That assumes we make no more acquisitions. That assumes there's no expiration upside of the assets. And these assets have a ton of expiration upside. So we think the actual number will be much, much higher than that. Even beyond that 15 year period, there's a significant and substantial amount of production and cash flow, but it just dips below that 110,000 ounce a year uh, number. One of the things <clears throat> that's important to understand about Sandstorm, if you compare us to our peers, we do have some peers, Triple Flag and the Cisco, is the way we guide our production is we do not put any assets into our production if they're not effectively permitted and in construction being built by large companies that are capable of building the project and have the financing at hand to do it. We have a number of assets in our portfolio where that's not quite the case, and we do not include those things in our guidance. And you can see him, them here on the right side, uh, things like the Mara asset, which would add another 20 to 25,000 ounces a year to our production expansions at Flat Reef and mines like Fruta del Norte, and there's a company called Kinross that's going to be building a mine called Lobo Marte. All of those things, if any of them happen, will add to our guidance and will increase our cash flow beyond this. I think a, a number of our peers, when they guide their sort of longer term numbers, they include, uh, and, and that's not necessarily a, a bad way of disclosing it, and certainly I'm not calling them out for that, I'm just showing the conservatism that Sandstorm is using in our guidance. We want people to know that the guidance are, are numbers that they can kind of take to the bank, if you will, so to speak. So more important than just ounces is what does that look like in terms of cash flow? Uh, cash flow that's able to be used to uh, do things like pay down debt and uh, pay dividends and share buybacks and, and grow the company. This is the cash flow that the portfolio generates on an after-tax basis. It's really important to note that this is on an after-tax basis. And we have structured ourselves so that in all of our streams and royalties around the world, we do pay tax. Some of our our peers have structured themselves where they don't pay tax, they're in tax haven jurisdictions, and there's a global alternative, a global uh, minimum tax that is coming in place. It's going to affect them, but won't affect us. So you can see cash flow in this year, 2023, getting up to you know $160 million, and eventually getting up to over $180 million a year of peak cash flow and maintaining that for a very long period of time. You juxtapose that against our debt. Um, we used to, we took on about $625 million of debt to do all of those big acquisitions. I talked about the billion dollars worth of acquisitions last year, but we have massively paid that debt down already. We're already down to $465 million as we speak and dropping fast. And you can see why there's just so much cash flow coming into the business. We'll be, we'll have this entire portfolio and be debt free here within a handful of years. It's also worth noting that this cash flow was done at $1,800 gold prices. So at higher gold prices, there's obviously more cash flow. Nothing groundbreaking. Being a gold company, if gold prices go up, you would expect our cash flow to go up, and it does. So getting up over to that $210 million uh, per year of free cash flow of gold was, say, uh, $2,200 an ounce. One thing that's worth noting is the commodity mix. I alluded to it a little bit earlier that uh, we have gold, we have silver, we have a bit of copper and other. If you look at Sandstorm today in 2023, we're expecting 68% of our production to be coming from precious metals. You know, that's 49% gold, 19% silver, and about 22% copper. Uh, over the next few years, uh, we expect that to be about 70% precious metals by 2025. But notice there's an increase in the gold concentration and less silver. So about 56% gold, 14% silver. And then all of the assets that are in construction right now for us, as our production profile ramps up and as our cash flow ramps up, they're all gold assets. And so our gold revenue and silver revenue goes to 80% of, of all of our, our revenue. So very, very gold focused. And going forward, the only things that we're looking at acquiring are gold or silver is interesting to me these days, especially when it relates to the um, breakdown of gold and silver is that I'm very bullish on gold. I know gold CEOs almost universally always say that. Uh, they feel like they're paid to say that and they have to say it even if they don't believe it's true. Um, if you go back and you look over my career and earnings and investor calls, when I'm not bullish gold, I say I'm not bullish gold. If I think gold prices are going down, I say I think gold prices are going down. 
but I've, I've never truly been more bullish on gold prices longer term in my career than I have been now. I'm on the board of the World Gold Council, and we get to see the sort of numbers behind the scenes of central banks and, and reports on what central banks are, are doing and uh, sometimes what they're saying and how they're thinking. But it is very, very clear to me that there is a global U.S. dollar de-dollarization trend happening and that central banks are buying gold like crazy. They're buying gold in record numbers. They're buying gold month after month. And they're trying to get off reliance of the U.S. dollar, especially countries that are not necessarily in the, the U.S.'s good books, countries like China and so on and so forth. They would much rather have exposure to gold than exposure to the U.S. dollar because uh, they don't want the U.S. to be able to sanction them if they fall afoul of U.S. foreign policy. And so for that, um, there's a huge international global bid in the price of gold, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. So moving on to Sandstorm's portfolio and our top assets, uh, we've got a list here. These are our top 10 assets by value. We call it net asset value or NAV. And you can see that no one asset is more than 12% of our value. And no one country is greater than 14% of our total value. Where you see a black check mark on this slide, that it means the asset is new to us in the last year because it came in in this billion dollars worth of acquisitions that we just made. So uh, if people look at Sandstorm a few years ago and they go, oh yeah, I know Sandstorm. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> we've changed dramatically and we've grown a lot over the last year and really have increased the quality of our portfolio. Uh, one of the things that I think it's important to note is mine life, uh, for example. And so going down this list, Hod Modern, it's a mine that's going into production uh, shortly here over the next few years. And it's it's got a 13-year mine life and growing. There's enormous amounts of exploration upside at that asset. Antamina, that's a huge mine in uh, Peru that we have a, a royalty on and a stream on. And it's a multi-decade mine life. Flat Reef is a multi-decade mine life. Valet is a multi-decade mine life. So is Blyvore. Greenstone is a 15-year mine life and growing with lots of exploration upside. Chapada is a multi-decade mine life. Uh, Casarones, that's the mine that the Lundin Group just bought. And in fact, Chapada before it is a mine that <laughs> the Lundin Group bought. It's sort of a theme here. Lundin's buying mines that we have streams and royalties on and then massively drilling it out and finding exploration upside and and then we get the benefit of that uh, so on and so forth Arizona um, it's been mined for 13 years and there's still a long mine life ahead of it and Oyotogo will probably be about a 60 year mine life so you can see that there's where we've concentrated our assets they are uh, high quality assets with very very long life mines but the gist of this is trying to show the track record that we have over time of doing smart transactions and the last 10 years since we hired our technical team uh, we haven't made a, an investment that we regretted and you can see here on this slide i'll just use an example orizona that was one of our first acquisitions 75 million dollars that's the black bar that's what we paid to acquire that stream 159 million dollars in the gold that's how much cash back we've already received 70 million is what the residual value of because the mine's still operating what the present value of the expected future cash flows is so we paid 75 for something we've got 229 million dollars of value so far in counting and you can see for all of our, our major acquisitions we've ran those calculations and you can see how much money we've made thematically um one of the things that i think is interesting to me at least is when i go and i market to large multi-billion dollar institutional investors around the world. I just did that a couple of weeks ago I was in, in London. And historically, one of the things that I would hear from them, if, if they're not gold investors, let's say they're a generalist, generalist investor that may or may not have any gold exposure in their portfolio. And if they've decided that they're bearish in the economy, which most of them currently are, and that they do want to start adding some gold, which a lot of them are starting to want to do, that they just go and they just pick the biggest names. So they'll go Franco Nevada or Wheaton or Royal, and they'll pick one of those three. What they don't realize is that, that because everybody does that, they have been 
overpaying dramatically and in the long run will get much lower returns going forward. So Franco Nevada is trading at 2.3 times their net asset value. Uh, Wheaton is trading at 2.1 times their net asset value. And Royal Gold is trading at 1.9 times their net asset value. So you're paying double for every dollar of cash flow that you would if you could buy a company and say one times that asset value. Well, it just so happens there are three mid-tier companies now that all have grown up. And if you combine our portfolios together, so it's us, Sandstorm, there's a company called Triple Flag and a company called the Cisco Gold Royalties. Our portfolios combined produce about the same amount as Royal Gold, one of those three majors. And yet our portfolios combined are only trading at 1.2 times now. I think it's even come off a little bit since we did this slide, maybe 1.1 times now. So the point of this being, there's never been a better time to own the materials relative to the majors. And you can synthetically create a major by buying some of the, the mid-tier royalty companies. And within that, I think it's worth noting that Sandstorm is the one that has the most free rating uh, potential uh, we're trading at below nav at, at this moment and i think the reasons are are threefold one is we just uh, did a lot of deals and we've got debt that we want to pay down it was 625 million dollars of debt it's already down to 465 million and counting and so time is solving that one and that issue is going away but uh, the the other issue is a, a combination of we did those deals, we issued shares when we did those deals as well. And over the last year, we have had to absorb $400 million US of net selling pressure during a period of time when the market was not fantastic. And I ended up uh, personally, and I hadn't talked about this publicly until recently, in the hospital for a month and had long COVID and wasn't able to get on planes and talk to investors and market the company. So we had $400 million of net selling in a period of time where the CEO wasn't able to do any marketing and that was my fault. Um, but I'm, I'm better now, I'm healthy. I've been on planes nonstop for the last two weeks and we're just starting to get the message out and I'm heading out again to New York and Toronto next week. And, and so we're gonna go and get the story of what this new Sandstorm looks like after these billion dollars worth of deals out there to the market. And I do think that we'll have a, a trading multiple reversion and then our, our stock price will get quite a bit of of relative strength here. Yeah, if anyone really wants to dig into our guidance, I don't think we need to belabor this point, but in 2023, again, as I mentioned, we have 95,000 gold royalty and stream ounces. We have a couple contracts where it says we get 20% of production until X number of ounces, and then it drops to 10% of production. And so there's a bit of natural depletion that happens over the next four or five years in our portfolio. Uh, and then we've got all of these assets that are being built. This is this third highest probability growth line. It's things like uh, the Nomad assets that we acquired in those billion dollars worth of transactions. There's a mine called Greenstone, which is a big mine in Canada that's being built right now. Flat Reef is a huge mine being built by a company called Ivanhoe, Robertson is a mine being built by a company called Barrick, uh, so on and so forth. And um, and then Hod Modern is a mine that's being built by a company called SSR Mining. And that will take us up once those things are all done and they, they should be all completed construction in the next few years. Uh, we'll have 125,000 ounces a year. And then in addition to that, we think there's another 35,000 ounces that theoretically could come online if certain things happen. Like Flat Reef, it has a, a expansion plan that we think is going to be pulled forward and that'll give us more ounces. Mara is a mine that we think uh, Glencore has a chance of building in Argentina and that would give us 20,000 ounces a year. And so all in all, that would take us up to about 160,000 ounces uh, per year if those things happen, which is $2,000 gold is $320 million US a year revenue. And, and most of that is, is free cash flow. This is a, a bit more of a an esoteric concept, but it is a very, very important one. Not all mines are created equal. And if a mine is a high cost mine and it barely makes money, those mines tend to shut down sooner. There's usually not enough free cash flow generated by them to do the exploration required to continue to expand the life of the mine. If you don't have enough money to put in drills to find new gold, then the mine shuts down when you run out of known gold. 
Conversely, if you've got a mine that is making enormous amounts of cash flow because it's very high grade, a portion of that cash flow gets used to go find more gold on the property and the mine just keeps going and going and going. And so for a streaming royalty company like Sandstorm, it's important to focus on acquiring assets where the underlying mine is of very high quality and very low cost. And so we've color coded our production here for us as well as all of our peers. And you can see at Sandstorm, 54% of our top assets are coming from mines that can produce their primary product in the lowest cost quartiles from the bottom 25% of mines. So just very, very low cost, very high profitable mines. And then you can see in that dark gold there is the second cost quartile. The vast majority of our production is coming from mines that make above average money because they produce their primary product at below average cost. And that just makes our portfolio stronger, more stable, safer, and have more exploration upside. And you can see none of our competitors come close to us in terms of quality of underlying uh, mines cost-wise. Diversification is also something that's really important. If you're looking at investing in, in any company in the world, especially a uh, mining company, and in particular, in our case, a streaming royalty company, uh, this chart is showing what of the top five assets that us and each of our competitors have, what percent of our company value do those top five assets represent? Sandstorm, you can see our top five five assets represent 42% of our value, so reasonably diversified. Most of our competitors, uh, and some will be surprised to see this because they just assume that Franco Nevada is the most diversified uh, streaming royalty company in the world. Most of our competitors, the top five assets account for between 60 to 70% of their value. So they're not nearly as diversified as one would expect. In Sandstorm, you can see where we have concentrated risk in our top five assets. There are those black color coded again. Again, that means they're in the lowest cost quartile. So where we've concentrated risk, it's on very, very high quality assets. And you see from some of our competitors, those lighter gold colors where they've concentrated risk, they're on higher, higher cost assets, which are of lower quality. And so again, just to show that Sandstorm, we've built a portfolio that's strong, that's diversified and that's stable. Sometimes we get the question of, of geographically, where are we? And the answer is all over the world. Uh, we're very globally diversified. You can see from this chart that uh, everywhere there's a, a gold dot with a ring that's a producing asset and a gold, just a single gold dot is a development or an exploration asset. Uh, we tend to be concentrated in the Americas, Canada, United States, Mexico, South America, we have a little bit of exposure in Africa, Australia, and then a smattering throughout the rest of the world. I am a big believer that the best way to deal with political risk is to never allow any one country to have too much power over you or over your assets, because you never know which politicians and which country is going to go crazy for which period of time. And so we very purposely built a portfolio that is globally diversified. I'll talk really briefly here about exploration success. Uh, this is an important point to understanding the above average rates of return that this business is capable of generating over the very long term. So the average mine mines for two and a half times longer than what is expected on it on the day the mine is started up. And finding streams and royalties on mines that are even better than that is been our focus. We have a very strong geological technical team. We've got a number of geologists that look at all the potential deals we do and tell us whether or not they think these assets have expiration upside or not. So this is a chart here you know, on a year by year basis of how many meters our partners have drilled on the properties to try to find expiration upside at no cost to Sandstorm because at Sandstorm, we get all of the expiration upside for free. We don't have to pay for it. We don't contribute to the drilling, but we do get the ounces or the royalty if they find them. And the proof is in the pudding for this. These gold bars are how many gold royalty ounces we were given during that particular year. And the black bar is how many gold equivalent royalty ounces were found through expiration upside on those properties during that same year. And so you can see we're five years running now. We're still calculating the numbers for 2022 because they don't publish the data until late in 2023 about what they found in 2022. So the most recent data we have is for 2021. But you can see year after year after year after year, 
more ounces have been found on those properties attributable to Sandstorm than have been uh, delivered to us under our contracts, which means we get all of the cash flow for the entire year. And then at the end of the year, for no additional payment, we have even more ounces on the books than we did at the beginning of the year. And so the proof is in the pudding here, and our team has done a good job of picking properties and putting them into our portfolio where there's lots of expiration upside. I'll talk really briefly here a little bit about growth and how we plan on growing the company going forward. Um, we did, as I mentioned, just make a billion dollars worth of acquisitions. And that organic growth that we have already bought, this is point number one on the slide 20, the, the billion dollars worth of things that we've already bought, those things are being built and put into production. And so we are going to organically grow because of the things that we have already purchased. So no more acquisitions are required by us to do that growth of 30 to 40 percent over the next number of years. The second piece and leg of our growth is this Mara Goldstream. So this is a mine that Glencore is potentially building in Argentina. Uh, we, a number of years ago, acquired an exclusive option to acquire a 20 percent gold stream on that asset for two hundred and twenty five million dollars US. We priced that option back when the gold price was about one thousand four hundred dollars per ounce. And that's how we arrived at that $225 million number. And now as gold prices rise, so we're sitting here at almost $2,000 now, that purchase price or option price does not rise. So our option is getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the money. It would be worth a lot more than $225 million if it were priced today. And so whenever they do build that mine, they have to come to us and give us an option to buy 20% of their gold for $225 million. And at that point in time, we, we will likely say yes to that. And we'll have a very, very valuable stream that will increase our production. So that's sort of the second piece of our growth. And then the third piece is uh, I really am a believer that the green energy transition is going to be one of the best capital allocation opportunities of most people's careers. There's enormous amounts of money that's going to have to go into energy infrastructure. And over a trillion dollars, I think, is going to have to go into uh, producing new base metal mines to be able to feed the metals, particularly copper, for that green energy transition. And so we've got a, a new up-and-coming uh, copper company called Horizon Copper. Sandstorm owns 30% of it, and so long as it owns... 30% or more of it. It has the exclusive right of first refusal for any or stream or royalty that that company sells. And so the business plan there is Horizon Copper is going to go out and it's going to look for assets to acquire, uh, copper mines specifically, that have gold byproduct. And at the time of acquisition, Sandstorm will buy a gold stream or buy a gold royalty from Horizon to help Horizon pay for that acquisition. So those are the, the three legs to our growth over the next little while. Uh, debt repayment is, is happening very rapidly right now. So depending on what the gold price is, the gold price is $1,800 an ounce. Debt goes from where it is today to zero over the next four years. Uh, if gold is higher, you know, $2,200 an ounce, we get a debt to zero even faster than that. Even though our net debt is around that $455, $460 million, we actually have equity investments in other mining companies and loans that we have made to other mining companies. And so those loans that we've made to other mining companies are generating interest income for us. And so our, our debt net of our income generating assets, excluding this is not including our portfolio streams and royalties. This is just other income generating assets that we have on our balance sheet. Our debt net of those is only $157 million. So the way I'm thinking about it is over the next year and a bit, we'll get our debt, our net debt down to a number where our debt is about the same as our income generating assets elsewhere and our portfolio of of assets will pay for that debt and we can use the free cash flow uh, from our our portfolio of streams and royalties to either grow or to buy back shares if they, our share price stays as low or if we don't find things that we want to buy we'll just keep paying down the debt further <laughs> esg is something that's becoming really important in understanding the companies that people invest in. Uh, ESG has is, is been in our ethos since the beginning. Most people don't know this about me, but I I started a, a charity, educational charity in Africa that has 700 kids to this day. And I did that uh, with my wife many years ago. I started that even before I started Sandstorm. And so the types of people that I've hired at Sandstorm as I've grown my company are, are people that think like me. And so we built a company that has um, good fiber of being, if you will. Uh, throughout. Uh, we're the first royalty company that had an ESG linked credit facility. 
one of the only companies in the mining industry that's just about 50% men and women. And uh, we are one of the top rated mining companies in the world from an ESG perspective. Uh, from a high level perspective, Sandstorm is a gold focused streaming and royalty company. Our portfolio is amongst the highest quality or the highest quality, very long life assets. We have diversification, we have built in growth. And really the plan for the next year or two is just to digest that growth, rake in the cash flow, uh, reset the balance sheet and get ready for our next leg of growth over, over the next few years. Uh, it's, it's been exciting building the company to this point. And I think we're sort of on the precipice of starting to realize the fruits of our labor from a valuation perspective. Thank you, Nolan, for an informative presentation. Getting into the Q&A, in the first segment, we will be spending quite some time on gaining insight into how Sandstorm operate their business. We will learn more about the people and team at Sandstorm, how they generate investment ideas. We will also talk about their due diligence process and investment philosophy, as well as how the flow of decision making works within the company. Uh, okay, so you touched on this in uh, in the presentation, but could you just kind of uh, outline your career pri prior to joining Sandstorm a bit more, uh, a bit more in detail, and then leading leading up how to Sandstorm, uh, you know, how Sandstorm formed as a company. Yeah, so I've I've spent my entire career in the mining industry. My my background, I'm an FCPA, which is a fellow of the Institute of of CPAs, and I'm a CFA. But right out of university, I was the guy that firm started dragging around to do consulting for, for mines and heading to places like Myanmar and Korea and Mongolia and all over the world. So I've been doing that for a couple decades now. Uh, early on in my career, I started working with a company called Gold Corp back when they only had 16 employees in their head office. And uh, I was pretty junior back then, but those 16 people went on and, and took that into one of the three largest gold mining companies in the world over the ensuing few years. And along that journey, we started a company called Silver Wheaton. And I was dropped into Silver Wheaton as their first employee, and it was the world's first streaming company. And we grew that. I became their chief financial officer. In fact, I think I still hold the world record today for being the youngest ever chief financial officer of a multi-billion dollar New York Stock Exchange listed company. They put me as CFO when I was 26 years old. <laughs> and uh, so we grew that from nothing to about a $5 billion market cap company. And then eventually I stepped out and decided to try to do it on my own and started a sandstorm and have been growing that ever since. So could you, uh, could you kind of tell us about, you know, how the corporate structure looks like at Sandstorm? It's a small team and, you know, how does the business operate? Yeah, it's one of the things that I like about this type of business is that it, it's not a mining company, so you don't need 4,000 employees. Uh, we're right now we're about a two billion dollar market cap Canadian, call it a billion and a half dollar market cap US, and we're managing that with about twenty nine employees, and that's right from CEO all the way down to reception. Uh, really, the functionally, the vast majority of our employees are in the corporate development and or technical side, so geologists, engineers who are looking and evaluating at the assets that our corporate development team, sort of the finance guys and girls, if you will. Are, are looking, so they work hand in hand. Um, and then we've got the, obviously the finance and accounting function, we're being a New York soccer team, so as a company, you have to comply with all securities regulations and Sarbanes-Oxley compliance and all of those types of things. So it's really, those are the three parts of, of our team and there's not very many people in that office. So I'm thinking with such a small team, you have a lot of opportunities. Do you kind of do external hires i mean you hire some people external to the company to assist with the due diligence or how does that work yes yeah, so the vast majority of the work is done by our internal team uh, so we have both engineers and geologic engineers and and geologists that and then different geologists specialize in in different types of assets we do when we go to a company and we get really serious about a deal where it looks like there really is the potential to do a hundred million dollar transaction, we don't just read their technical reports and trust their technical people. We actually download all of the technical data that they have right to the drill data and the metallurgical analysis and, and we'll redo it from the ground up ourselves before we make that investment for the most part. Um, every now and then, if you come in contact with a miner, you're like, hey, our technical team, we haven't seen, we're not experts in that one particular area. They'll pull in one of their friends in the industry that will hire them to a consulting contract to sort of 
check on that that one particular area. So, you know, a lot of real factors are hard, if not impossible, to quantify in an NPV cash flow calculation. So, and these factors are likely to make the difference between a good and a bad investment decision uh, over a long uh, time horizon. So, touching on your investment philosophy at Sandstorm, what are the key things that you are looking for in the projects you're investing in? And, you know, how do NPV cash flow calculations kind of feed into your investment decision making? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, an NPV calculation is really just an Excel spreadsheet model, and its its accuracy is only as good as the inputs. And it's hard to uh, explain in a short, easy, synthesized way the way we look at it. But the truth is, when you're predicting the future, there are many different probability subsets of pathways that the mind's life could go down. Um, political risk affects things. Social risk affects things. Uh, to the downside exploration success affects things to the upside increasing commodity prices uh, affects things to the upside the quality of how the the health of the company overall and what the 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 economy is doing and so you could have one mine and it depends on how the future unfolds it depends how many years does that mine go for it and so what we try to do is rather than just make one model one excel model which is almost what all of our competitors do you know we know how they make decisions. They make one Excel model. They say, this is our model. This is what we think that stream of wealth is worth. What we do is we make many different models and we create discrete scenarios. We almost do a probability weighted scenario analysis of what that thing could be worth and then analyze what are, what are, what is it worth in the, all those downside scenarios? What is it worth in all of those upside scenarios? And where we pass on opportunities is we say, those downside scenarios are, are, don't look great. And their probabilities are higher than one might intuitively I think, and so we're just going to pass on those opportunities, and, and we really focus our time where there's really ways to win big, and um, and the probability of those scenarios where you win big are, are not immaterial. And so, if you construct a portfolio of things while you're thinking that way probabilistically, you're not always going to get every individual thing right, but the portfolio on average performs really well. So. In terms of, I mean, what kind of differentiates a good quality royalty company from a bad one is if you get the expiration upside right. So you have your technical people that, that go in and, and evaluate that, but do you attempt to model that into, you know, your your NPV calculations? You kind of say, okay, we think that the optionality here for finding more or, you know, down the line is worth this much. And do you put some kind of premium to to that of course in an mpv calculation p- past 15 years it's worth nothing but really it will be worth a lot for you in due time so yeah no that's that's a, that's a great question so we'll, we'll start with a base case model and i'll just use 100 million dollars as an example pretend it's a 100 million dollar deal the base case model says it's worth 100 million dollars then what we'll do is we'll do all of those other scenario analysis that i was talking about and we'll say well what's it worth in those scenarios and then we'll assign probabilities to them and then we'll come up with a new number and we call that number our shadow valuation. It's not a net present value because it's it's all of the, the probabilities of all of the scenarios that you can conceive happening. And so it's not a real number. It's just kind of a shadowy number. But you could have a mine where that shadow value spits out at 80 million instead of 100. But you could have a mine where the shadow value spits out at 180 million instead of 100. And so it gives you this intuitive sense for, on average, am I going to win with this this asset or assets like these? And, and that's kind of how we analyze it. So in terms of, you know, the life cycle of mineral discovery, Sandstorm, where, where do you kind of prefer to make entries into your investments and, and why? Yeah, so that's one thing that's changed over the years for Sandstorm. So I think in an earlier version of Sandstorm 10 years ago, we were getting a little bit more early in the life cycle. We saw we were a smaller company, but we saw lots of, of value of taking some more earlier stage risk, if you will, on on development uh, and those types of things. Today, we are a much bigger company. We're a much more stable company. Our, our investors, on average, are large institutional investors and pension plans. And we are really focused on, because we are stable and we are large, not reintroducing a new type of risk. So we tend to focus much more later down the development curve. So right now, for example, the types of things that we're looking at acquiring are almost all 
uh, producing assets with every now and then we'll look at a development asset, but only if it's a really high quality uh, mining company building the asset. So, I mean, now you've re reached kind of a, a critical mass, you've become quite large in the space, one of the largest companies. Uh, so is it more common now that you get approached proactively by companies or is it still that y you approach the companies that you find in interested in? Or... It, it is both, but it's changed in the sense that we went through this life cycle. You know, when we started Sandstorm, no one had ever heard of Sandstorm and so no one was ever calling us. And so it was always us going and calling people. And then we became well known in the industry as sort of a preferred partner for mine finance. And we just got this massive deluge of inbound calls. And we were, I was getting calls multiple times a day that, you know, we have to defer to our technical team and to, to our, our corporate development team. And uh, I found we sort of woke up one day and we realized we we're just playing defense. We were just like fielding calls and then checking on these things. And we realized that when people were calling us on average, the asset quality was lower than when we were calling them. And so we've reverse engineered and, and matured in, in how we do corporate development now, where we will listen if people call us, but generally speaking, if they're calling us, we're not that interested. We have a, a very uh, purposeful methodical, process that we go through to identify the things we want to acquire and then we go and figure out how to do it. Yeah. And um, touching on the shareholder structure, I mean, who are the principal shareholders of Sansom? I know it's quite diversified, but you have a couple of large shareholders. Yeah. So it's a, a public company with about 55,000 uh, shareholders out there. The largest uh, institutional shareholder is a private equity firm called Orion Mine Finance. Uh, they been a fantastic shareholder. We have uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. We've got a couple of the largest funds out of London, um, Capital International, that just became a top 10 shareholder. We've got large pension plans in British Columbia that are shareholders. In terms of individual shareholders, I'm one of the larger individual shareholders. Um, my, my personal net worth goes up and down three to $4 million for every $1 change in Sandstorm share price. Uh, which works out to be about 20 years of my after-tax base salary because I don't take a, I don't take a high base salary. So, um, you know, sometimes you'll see public companies out there that are lifestyle companies where the CEO just wants to keep running the company because they want to keep running the company because they want to keep collecting the salary. Um, you know, if I can make sense to share price book, one more dollar that equates to 20 years of work for me. So <laughs> I'm just I'm focused on the share price. And I want to touch touch on that. So just to clarify, how much of your net worth is invested in in, in Sandstorm? Yeah, it's probably 70 percent of my net worth. Exactly. And your annual compensation um, uh, from Sandstorm uh, equates to what currently? Do you include bonuses on average or something like that? Yeah. So the way we do things is is uh, low fixed compensation and then high variable. Um, so, for example, my base salary is about uh, $400,000 US, I believe, off the top of my head. In Canada, we pay really high taxes. We're at 54% tax. So, on an after tax basis, I only take home about $180,000 a year. Um, and then, if we do deals, we get bonuses uh, and, and stock based compensation, whether that be restricted share units or, or stock options. And, you know, some years the bonus is zero, and in some years it's, you know, $700,000. So, um, it really just depends on whether we've performed or not. And so that way we're trying to tie our performance as a management team to the experience that the shareholders are having. Yeah. And you mentioned, of course, you, 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 you believe that you have the best of the best people, right? And you want to retain these people. People try to poach them from you, I'm sure. And at the same time, so, so few people in the company have a lot of influence on the share share price in the, at the end of the day. So. How do you ensure that you know everyone at Sansom has skin in the game and, and really have drive to to make sure that they drive share price, shareholder value? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, and, and the answer is it depends on the type of um, employee they are and what department they're in. So I'll, I'll give you an example. If you think about a corporate development person, you think like a an aggressive business finance oriented person. Um, they tend to really uh, like that variable compensation and want to add value to the company don't mind low base salaries. I have found though that, for example, on the technical side, um, people that are geologists, they're a little more 
maybe risk averse uh, personality wise and value stability uh, over that variability that we tend to go more higher base compensation and lower variable uh, low and in some cases no variable to to those individuals also we, we want to ensure that we never create an incentive for a technical person who's doing due diligence to say yes to an asset because they yeah, think they might get a course. bonus at the end of the year because we did a bunch of deals we want the technical people to stay unbiased and if it's not a good deal say no because it doesn't matter you're not getting a bonus anyway you're just you know you'll get a higher base salary the next year if you continue to prove your work i used to touch back on you know the corporate structures you have your corporate development people how does the decision making process work what's the flow of decision making within the company we we meet every tuesday morning uh, the entire corporate development team uh, and including me just so that we all know what everyone's working on so if anyone's working on something that we're like don't don't waste your time on that i looked at that asset 15 years ago it doesn't make sense and so that's really sort of a filtering process and a strategizing process that we do and then once we decide that we are going forward with the file we've got ian grundy who is our head of corporate development and he will assign which people to the file that he's going to work on for that that specific file and then it has to progress a certain number of hurdles so uh, he'll then start getting the technical team looking at it at an uh, early view we have this process called the white rabbit where it's uh, in order to use extensive resources of the firm, it has to pass that meeting of the investment committee. And so the technical team will have looked at it at that phase, and then we'll have a whole management conversation about it. And if it doesn't pass that, the file's dead, and it doesn't move forward. If it does pass that phase, then it'll get into increasing levels of negotiation between the businesses, but also increasing levels of, of technical due diligence. So is the screening of ideas, is that individual or is that delegatory, that someone that I, and for example, says, you, you're going to look at this company, it's a bit of both. Yeah, it's both. Uh, so our our corporate development team is very experienced, and the first line of screening things is them just knowing what's good and what's not. And and not, I would say eighty percent of the stuff that we say no to, it never makes it into the investment committee uh, meetings because the technical person just knows it's it's not a quality asset. And so uh, once something makes it into the investment committee process, if you will, and diligence, and then that's when we start. And we, we say no to probably ninety eight percent of things that we look at. All right. Hello, Ian. Um, could you tell you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, your career at Sandstorm? Um, what are your responsibilities? Yeah, thanks, Gorm. Um, glad to join you today. My name is Ian Grundy. Uh, I lead the corporate development team at Sandstorm Gold. Uh, I've been with the company for about five years now, all uh, within the corporate development function. Uh, I joined from uh, work experience at prior Canadian investment banks covering the mining and metal sector and equity research. Uh, and I've been a key part of the, the finance due diligence team over that period, it's seen us grow from uh, a company producing 50 to 60,000 geos a year to this year, uh, 90 to 100,000 geos, and then over the next uh, few years, growing that by another 20 to 30 percent to 125,000 geos. Um, so my background is as an accountant originally, um, and on the finance side, and so I spent a number of years working in audit and valuations and then moved on to, to spend some time at investment banks covering all sorts of metals and mining companies that uh, produced every commodity outside of, uh, of oil and gas, which was covered separately. Um, and so I brought kind of a breadth of industry knowledge to Sandstorm and that's um, kind of what's led me to this one. All right, so, so, so could you um, walk us through, you know, kind of start to finish the process of acquiring a stream of royalty at Sandstorm is to, 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 to allow everyone to understand how you guys actually operate the business at Sandstorm. Yeah, so obviously business development is, is the key part of the business. So we've got a team of four or five individuals on the finance side that, uh, that generate ideas and evaluate opportunities. And then we have a five to six person uh, technical team that helps us assess those opportunities from an engineering technical perspective. Uh, I think probably the most important part first is, is how do we come up with ideas? How do we uh, make a decision on what to proceed with and what to actually uh, evaluate from a DD perspective? Uh, we've looked at it over the last couple of years. I would say in general, we look uh, at several hundred opportunities a year uh, that come in through our door or we find ourselves. but the vast majority of those wouldn't pass an initial screening test. So 
had a sandstorm's primary focus for the last several years and continues to be to this day is on projects that are uh, either producing and cash flowing royalty or stream opportunities or uh, things that I would call uh, shovel ready or effectively last money in financing opportunities. So that's uh, development projects that need construction financing to move through um, their transition into a producing asset. So that right there gives you a pretty large filter um, to eliminate a lot of opportunities. We are also primarily a, a gold and uh, precious metal worth and streaming company. We have made some investments slightly outside that space in the last couple of years, uh, but that's the primary filter. And, and to get through without passing that precious metals filter, it has to be of an asset uh, of particular quality um, and scale that would make us want to have that exposure within the portfolio. Um, so in terms of how we first evaluate whether something's a fit, I would say those high level strategic fits are, are the first layer of the analysis. Um, and then it becomes uh, an assessment of, is this a good fit for Sandstorm in our, um, in our uh, portfolio as a whole? So when I say that, I'm talking about uh, opportunities where we take a quick look at the counterparty and jurisdiction to see if a new opportunity is, is a good fit uh, within that. Uh, most of our portfolio sits within the lowest half of the cost curve. So that's another uh, initial screening tool that we'll use to evaluate just on the surface. And then that will lead us into uh, a DD process uh, that test all of those initial assumptions when we find something that looks like it could be a fit for Sensor. Is, you know, the people factor, how much does this, I mean, how do you factor this in, in into the, you know, kind of earlier stages of the due diligence process? Yes. So when we start our due diligence process, um, a member of the, the finance team will sketch up what the opportunity is and why it could be a fit. And then we'll have an investment committee meeting. Uh, that sees our full corporate development team, the full technical team, and senior management get together to discuss the opportunity in a bit more detail, just based on a limited review of information. And one of the two or three main focuses of that meeting is going to be an initial assessment of the team. Because if we don't believe that the team has the right skill set, then we can't proceed with an opportunity. And sometimes that assessment is, you know, we like this team. They're really good at four out of the five things that we think they need to do. And the one that's missing, they're either a very well-connected group and they'll be able to find um, the missing piece to put that all together. Or we know the people that might be able to support there. And so we can help um, point the company in the right direction and, and discuss those like weak links with them. So that we make sure that they, they have the right team to say what they're trying to do and, and the basis on which we're investing. So at this stage of the company, um, you some opportunities are not really relevant anymore because you're becoming larger now. So do you have any hurdles for that in the filtering process as well now? Or you, you are focusing on a bit, you know, later stage projects, not, not as much, you know, early stage exploration type uh, yeah, when I first joined the company, I would say the majority of deals that we did at the time were very, very early stage exploration acquisitions where we would pay a few million dollars and uh, participate as a lead order in an equity financing and get uh, a pretty cheap royalty. And it, it really expanded the optionality within the portfolio. We have 250 royalties today, only 40 of them are cash flowing. And so we think that there's a lot of optionality that sits already within the portfolio. and we think our marginal dollar is probably more effective on some of the opportunities that I spoke about earlier, those cash flowing or, or near cash flowing opportunities. And so that's the main focus and particularly things that can move the needle a bit for Sandstorm. So that would be things in the range of uh, 35, $40 million and up. We'll consider things that are a bit smaller than that, but they've got to be pretty special. Yeah. Um, when you kind of get into the, you know, the modeling and due diligence phase, when you pass this initial phase, uh, could you kind of describe step by step how that usually looks like? If you have, a, say that you have a, a, a project with an economic study, for example, maybe you can use a, a, 
an example? Yeah, I, I think the easiest way to think about this, just because of the availability of information and how the process might start, is to bifurcate this into opportunities where we're looking at an existing royalty that's owned by a third party or where we're working directly with a company themselves. Um, and so I think a, an interesting example is the Fruta del Norte royalty that we bought in early 2019. Um, obviously a very high quality asset that's gone very well. Uh, through our in-house screening process, we identified that there was a 1% NSR on the project that had been retained by the original uh, vendors of the project that sold the project to Aurelian, who then sold it on to King Ross. Um, we started a desktop review based on public information that Lundin Gold had filed at the time. Uh, it was a strong strategic fit with what Sandstorm looks for, that being a really high quality, high grade asset that was just about to enter production. It was run by a very experienced, very successful team in the Lundin Group, and um, and it had fantastic exploration upside. So the first step was me and my colleague um, started working up a valuation of the royalty based on the, the feasibility study, uh, developed a detailed financial model that looked at uh, production profiles, costs, um, asset backing of, of FDN in general, probably not as much of a risk on that royalty, but is part of our standard process, uh, as well as evaluating the capitalization of money and gold in case gold prices didn't go in our favor. Uh, just to make sure that the debt and, and strength displays that they've taken on to construct the project weren't going to be an impediment to our royalty. Um, around that same time, we would kick off a legal review with um, with our uh, legal advisors to better understand uh, the tenure and security of the royalty, uh, which would be a pretty standard process for us. Um, in that case, it was our first um, meaningful investment into Ecuador, and so understanding those unique aspects of our jurisdiction are, are a pretty core part uh, of our DD process when uh, we're investing somewhere new. Um, and then at that same time, our technical team will start their review of all available public information on an asset um, at the same time to understand, you know, what is going to go well with the project, but just as importantly, what isn't going to go as well. So that initial review uh, for FDN, highlighted the fact that we saw uh, some downside to their recoveries. Um, and so then that became adjusted into our scenario analysis that we did when we evaluated the royalty. And that part has actually turned out to be true. They haven't quite hit the design rates on the recoveries, but the mine has performed better than expected because of throughput expansions and, um, and grade in general. It also highlighted immense exploration upside at the asset, which is really what made us attracted to the opportunity. Um, so with that um, initial understanding of the asset in hand, we approached the, the vendor of uh, the royalty, which is a, a private individual that still had the royalty, and made initial contact to start talking about his interest in selling the royalty. Um, in that case, I would say it was limited at the time, um, but we continued to do our work and continue to have conversations with that individual and um, talk them through where we saw value and, and how it makes make sense to, to crystallize value from that royalty uh, uh, on day one. So in another scenario, when you actually have to design the royalty yourself, uh, what I, I guess this, this question applies in any scenario, what kind of, you know, return requirements do you have on your invested, uh, I mean, on your royalties? Do you have any rigid structures there? Because I know, you know, with NPV calculations, they can give you one number, you can calculate something based on that, but then you have kind of intangibles that I assume you guys try to model in, you know, with or massive exploration upside. How do you value that in NPV model? Yeah, we, so what I've talked about to start with is kind of development of something close to a base case of how we look at an asset, but prior to making an investment decision and, and having something approved by our investment committee and then ultimately our board, we would never just look at, at one scenario. Um, we would always look at a range of outcomes from um, a uh, downside case, a bear case, a base case, an upside case, and a home run case. And we work together with our technical team to understand 
the key input drivers that might lead uh, to those different cases and then uh, try to apply a weighting to each scenario based on its, its relative likelihood. And, you know, sometimes it's kind of like a, a normal distribution curve uh, type weighting to each of the scenarios where the base case is it's highly likely where we have high confidence, but there's been other scenarios where uh, an investment hasn't passed because the downside scenario um, is too possible and the value at risk or the outcome in that scenario would be too significant. Uh, so it, it's balancing that mix of, mix of, of scenarios across both operating scenarios and price scenarios um, to evaluate whether we think we can buy something at um, a discount to its intrinsic value. And then that hurdle rate could vary a little bit uh, based on the type of assets, the amount of exploration upside that we could see, uh, the credit quality of the counterparty. Those would be key factors in making that decision. So uh, one thing, I mean, that one starts to think about a lot in this industry when you do the DCF models and you discount and you kind of start to realize, I mean, when you have generational mines, does, re does actually net present value calculations really get to the core of or the heart of the value of those assets? Or how do you guys deal with that? Do you kind of say, okay, we, we understand that this is the MPV, but it's worth paying a bit of a premium to a, what we think to be a you know, stellar, super long living. It might stick with Sandstorm for 30, 40 years. Yeah, that would definitely go into our assessment of um, what intrinsic value is and what kind of hurdle we would need to see on a particular asset. Something like um, Antonina or the Valet royalties that we own that are both super, super long dated um, royalties. The, the opportunity to hit multiple commodity price cycles on those assets because uh, of their long life, but also because of where they sit on the cost curve and the incentive that that creates for the operator to make them their core investment where they reallocate their first dollar um, definitely drives increased value that becomes a factor when we're making our decision. So just to give everyone a sense of how much are left by the wayside. So how, how many opportunities that you, you know, initiate uh, that kind of pass the filtering at least, uh, do you have to say, okay, this doesn't really work out. What, what, what would you say is the survival rate of, of the, yeah, so I think I said earlier a couple hundred. So let's, let's say in a given year, we look at 200 opportunities. I would say less than half of those pass an initial filtering that could be anywhere from five minutes to two or three hours and advanced actual diligence. Um, you know, sometimes you'll get an opportunity that looks kind of interesting, but it might not be a slam dunk fit. We'll have a meeting as a group and you know what? This isn't the right opportunity either because of the team or uh, the mine itself or the jurisdiction or something like that. And so I think you probably lose another 10 to 15% of the opportunities there. Um, so now I think we're down to 35, 40% would go through meaningful DD. Sometimes that's a couple of weeks. Sometimes that's many months. Um, in general, we found that we tend to execute and close on something in the order of two to three percent of opportunities that are evaluated. I see. Um, and then when you get to the negotiation and you know, kind of deal when you actually have to structure the royalty deal. Um, could you kind of give everyone a sense of that process works structurally at, at Sandstorm? You have to pass a bunch of uh, hurdles and then you get to that point. Who, who are responsible for putting together the deals and a uh, bit, bit more on that process? Yeah, I mean, primary responsibility would sit with me and my team on the, the finance side, using the outcomes from our DD to date to, to try to structure something that's a mutual fit uh, for both Sandstorm and for uh, our counterparty. Um, but you can't just say that's the finance team because the technical feedback and, and the financing feedback is so integral to that whole picture that they need to be done comprehensively. And, you know, one of the things that I found when I first um, joined Sandstorm is that the royalty and stream product uh, seems 
very simple on the outside. And you know, once they're executed, they are quite simple. It's a contract with standard terms. Most of the time, it's pretty easy to follow. But uh, to do it well, it's very important to uh, do your DD well and then to listen to your counterparty to understand what their objectives are. Because you know, sometimes you're going to be participating in a financing, let's say it's a construction financing, where you might be sitting alongside or behind project finance and understanding how your product interplays with the other lender uh, goes to the heart of how you're going to be viewed as a financing counterparty and finding ways to structure that allow uh, the company to be able to achieve what they want to achieve, to be able to ramp up an asset appropriately and reinvest in that asset in a way that's going to be beneficial for both of you um, is very, very important. Uh, and sometimes that's, uh, you know, what percentage of the metal should I stream? But sometimes it's, uh, you know, what kind of covenants should I have within a document and how should they move around within the life of the contract to make sure that this company can maximize value from its asset? Because really you are hoping for those win-win situations when you make the investment. So, so when you get uh, you know massive transactions like the base core and nomad transaction that you had last year, I mean I know that you've you have so much industry experience, so many of the assets you already know intimately, but a, a lot of new assets in a short period of time. So how do you manage to kind of review deals like that when you have a pretty small technical team? I assume you know site visits takes time. It, I mean each each individual asset must take at least a month, uh, you know, with quite intense work to really understand. Deeply. So, uh, how are you able to field uh, such uh, big transactions like that? Yeah. So, both Basecore and Nomad uh, are both uh, portfolios of assets, and so I would say, from a starting point, you use your initial scoping exercise to assess risks and importance within those portfolios and allocate scarce human capital time to where it's most important um, in the, the biggest, most material. Asset. So that, that was the first step. I also think like, these are good examples of things that take a lot of time to come to fruition. Like the market only sees them when they get announced. But you know, we commenced our, our DD on both of those opportunities in 2021, and we're advancing them for many, many months before they got announced. And so you know, we used site visits in 2022 to make sure that we could confirm all of our DD. But you know several months on the Intermina um, and quite a bit of time on other aspects of, of the base core portfolio. And the same, you know, Nomad is a company we've been watching for years. And um, I think fortunately in the case of their assets, um, it wasn't the first time that we looked at them, either because we've been thinking about them in a Nomad context before, but also in several cases, we had looked at financing a project um, in prior years. So in 2018, you know, we were uh, very, very close to providing initial Bonacro financing and ultimately decided to pass uh, because of where the asset was and, and the commodity price cycle. Orion proceeded with the financing, did some debt in the stream. Uh, and you know, our primary risk in that case was that at the current gold price, we weren't sure that uh, the phase four pushback made sense. Uh, the gold price ran significantly. The company got financed for that pushback and they were significantly through it by the time we were making our investments. So our outlook for that asset was dramatically different. And it was something where we had been to site and the asset very intimately as well. And so when we picked up our DD on, on Nomad, it wasn't very hard to just scrub off files on Bonacro. So that's just one example, but there were several within the portfolio where they were assets that we already knew reasonably well and helps accelerate the timeline under which you can complete that DD. Yeah. Uh, and I want to um, to just touch back br briefly on the, you know, when you get to the proposal stage, how often do you find yourself competing with other streaming and royalty companies uh, when the deal is proposed? Yeah. I mean, I think we try to find opportunities um, where uh, we provide an attractive solution or, um, or we can bring something unique to the table. And that 
you know, I'm sure you and Nolan spoke about Horizon is, is certainly something that differentiates us on, on that approach now. Uh, but, you know, realistically, a, a lot of the times, especially if it's a, a development financing or something like that, uh, our, our counterparties, this is a very important decision for them, and their management team and board have a fiduciary duty to make sure that they understand uh, what financings they're doing and why they're appropriate. So whether that's a formal process of talking to our peers, I wouldn't say that happens every single time. And I, I, it would be impossible for me to quantify that, but there's always the backdrop of, uh, there's, you know, four to five other big royalty companies and numerous other small competitors, uh, that we're being benchmarked against. So uh, we include that in our analysis of trying to understand where would the market be for this opportunity. Um, knowing that they're either going to talk to those parties directly or they need to understand why our deal makes sense for them um, in the absence of doing that. And, and in terms of your, I mean, of course, um, you have a couple, like three, four companies that are significantly larger than you, but what would you say is Sandstorm's competitive advantage compared to your, you know, two pairs, mid-size and then also the smaller components, and then when you actually have to compete with Wheaton or Frank or uh, Royal? Yeah, so I, I think with the smaller companies, it's the availability of cash and, and cash flow, um, because um, there's some opportunities where you could pay for an existing royalty with a combination of cash and, and stock. That's not something that's particularly attractive to us you know, as we sit here today. Um, but that's really the sweet spot for some of the smaller companies with less access to cash flow. And so, you know, I find that our primary competition comes from those other four to five big um, royalty companies or from private equity as royalty and streaming products. Um, sometimes we'll find a company just doesn't care what the cost of capital is. They like an Orion structure because it's fully capped or, you know, something else that would eliminate some of the optionality that we would try to pursue. Uh, so I think, you know, that's part of it is finding a synergy of where the product that you're going to offer a counterparty fits within their decision framework. Um, in terms of the other two mid tiers, I think that uh, we are able to move quite quickly with our DD process. Uh, if we find an opportunity that's a strong fit. Um, and I think uh, either jurisdictionally or in structuring to meet their counterparties objectives, we've been a bit more flexible on how we work through uh, our financings um, to structure them. You know, sometimes it's in a way where we take down a bigger piece of a financing as a whole to get it over a line. And that results in a stream structure uh, that has higher deliveries for a period of time and steps down a bit more. Some of our peers don't like that structure as much. And you know, from our perspective, it's a bit less of a step down. So thinking about it more as a comprehensive financing where the first piece of the financing is maybe a bit more expensive because it's kind of like a bridge royalty finance. And then you know, a traditional royalty that underlies that product. Um, so I think it's just a function of thinking a little bit differently about, uh, about the product and some of our peers. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, I, I, since you're a very, very important person at Sandstorm, how much of your personal net worth is, is, is uh, you know, allocated with Sandstorm exposed to Sandstorm share price? Yeah. So I have to hold three times my base in uh, Sandstorm stock. Uh, I would say if you exclude real property holding, something in the order of 65 to 70% of my, my net worth is, is tied to Sandstorm stock. Getting into the second segment, we will go over the acquisitions of Basecore and Nomad royalty portfolios that has transformed Sandstorm into a much larger entity. We will also go over the significance of the partnership with Horizon Copper, a company that was birthed out of Sandstorm's restructuring of their interest in Hod Maiden. So, the, first of all, the transformation of the interest in Hod Maiden, positioned as a pure streaming and royalty company, 
and simultaneously at birth, you know, this new partnership with uh, Horizon Copper. Uh, so could you outline the rationale and potential uh, symbiosis of the st strategic partnership with Horizon Copper? Yeah, so I guess there's really two parts to it. One is uh, we owned a 30% interest in in the hot modern asset inside Sandstorm. Um, and uh, feedback from shareholders was, it does kind of look and feel like a stream, but it's not really a stream. We would prefer it if you really made it a pure stream so that Sandstorm could say it's a pure streaming royalty company with no no major direct uh, interest in mines. And so we did that. We, we decided we were going to sell that asset off and we were going to take back the stream. And so that was sort of the first rationale for Horizon. But the second rationale for Horizon is I really do believe that there is a massive worldwide deficit in the copper markets coming. If we're going to do this green energy transition that the world needs, the world needs way, way, way more copper than we know where to get. And so it just so happened that this hot modern asset had copper and gold in it. And so if we we're putting it into this company, Horizon Copper, we kind of had the seed at the beginning of what could become a copper mining company if we uh, allowed it to go out and buy other copper mining interests like we did with the, the Antimina NPI that we just uh, recently announced that we've, we've put into uh, Horizon Copper as well. So Horizon Copper is sort of the bud of a new up and coming um, copper mining company. And I think everyone, not just in our office, but everyone in the entire mining industry worldwide is super bullish on copper prices. And so it just so happens that many good copper mines have lots of gold byproduct that come out of them. And we just happen to be a gold byproduct streaming company. <laughs> and so I think there's some synergy uh, for us to go out and have Horizon look for copper mines to buy where there's a lot of gold byproduct and Sandstorm can at the exact same time that they acquire the mine, Sandstorm can just step in and buy the gold stream or gold royalty from the byproduct on that mine at the same time. So it's sort of a, a way for us to get a captive amount of deal flow and I think get a higher rate of return for investors because on those types of transactions, we won't be competing against any of our streaming and royalty uh, peers because we have a right of first refusal to do streams and royalties from Horizon already. So they can't go phone our peers. Actually, they're contractually prevented from doing that. So uh, I think it's a way to grow Sandstorm and take advantage of the green energy transition at the same time. Uh, to me, it makes sense for sure. But could you could you try to describe and use, uh, let's use Antamina, you recently closed that now, to kind of, as an example, to highlight how that creates more value for share, Sandstorm shareholders. Yeah, I, I would say that Antamina was a good uh, part of the starter kit for Horizon. I would be careful to say it's, I don't think, indicative of the types of transactions that Horizon will be doing going forward. And, and I'll explain the difference between the two. So you know, with Antamina, it was a, a profits interest on a copper mine. That copper mine also produces some silver. And so what we did is we had Sandstorm come in and buy that interest, give uh, most of the royalty to Horizon, and Horizon paid for it with an IOU and a silver, a synthetic silver stream. So Horizon now has to take the embedded silver in the payments that they get from the Antimina mine, and they have to give that silver over to Sandstorm. So Sandstorm, we stay the, the, the precious metals streaming and royalty company, and then Horizon has this, this copper asset. And so we're able to sort of bifurcate those two parts of the value. One thing that I think is different from that versus what will be going forward is I think going forward, Horizon will be more likely buying mines themselves directly. They won't go through Sandstorm and over Horizon. Horizon will go by the mine itself and then Sandstorm will just help it by buying a gold stream or a gold royalty on the day of acquisition. Uh, and the idea with Horizon as it grows, they will start building up their own um, their own team. Right now, I assume you're sharing due diligence uh, between, between the two companies, but I assume that they will start building up their own. Yeah, one thing we want to make sure is we don't have, we don't waste GNA and have them looking at mines with their technical team and us looking at mines with our technical team and everybody disagreeing. So we're focusing on uh, just having one team that we look at, at things together with. On the administrative side, so for example, Horizon's got out and hired uh, their own chief financial officer who's now running the finances of the company. That's a totally separate uh, process from Sandstorm now. Slowly over time, as Horizon grows, it will build up its own independent team. 
you, you guys went through with trans transformation and acquisitions of Nomad Royalty Company and Base Core Portfolio last year. So, first of all, how I mean, how did the transactions come together? Did did you guys approach them, or did these parties approach Sandstorm? And what were the rationale from the seller's point of view, uh, selling these assets to you guys? Yeah, it, each one was unique. So in the case of uh, the base core part of the transaction, so that was uh, privately owned by the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan and Glencore, and they had decided to wrap, wrap up their business. So they hired uh, the Royal Bank of Canada to phone a few of the likely buyers and, and in Sandstorm, we felt like uh, those were assets that we wanted to acquire. So that, that one came to us. In the case of Nomad, we went to them. We knew their largest shareholders. Uh, we really liked their, their management team and their people that we trusted. So we felt comfortable talking directly to them. We talked to their management team and uh, they, they gave us permission to talk to their shareholders. And we found a transaction that we think made sense for uh, shareholders of Nomad and, and shareholders of Sandstorm. So we acquired them. Why did uh, Nomad, for example, decide to exit? I mean, did you retain any of the people at Nomad or did, did you not do that? It seems like a royalty co company, you know, acquiring a royalty company, there must be some kind of human reason for why the team at Nomad decided to, you know, stop. No, their, their management team is um, very competent, very entrepreneurial. Um, and they sort of did this as a startup and, and got good equity positions in the company and wanted to uh, right by shareholders and, and make some money and and they're off and they're going to go start up their their next venture one of uh, the people the cfo of nomad actually is a very very intelligent uh, woman named elif who used to be the cfo of a cisco gold royalties which is one of our larger competitors and so uh, we had a great experience working with her and she actually just got elected to our board of directors uh, last week so uh, we got a you know great relationship with their team Uh, so uh, just a bit of a bit background on the acquisitions. What did the due diligence period, you know, look like for these acquisitions? How long were the deals in the making? Yeah, months. Um, interestingly enough, a number of the assets that ended up in them, we were familiar with. Our technical team had been familiar with a number of those mines already, not all of them. And so we had to sort of pick pick our spots as to where we were going to do due diligence. Um, our technical team spent a bunch of time flying around the world going to the mines of their assets and uh, writing up reports. And, and so that process took several months. Since you went through with the acquisitions, we know that you are, you have a track record of being very diligent and uh, you yourself are a large shareholder. So it's obvious that you guys concluded that a $1.1 billion acquisition and some dilution to your optionality built into your existing high quality portfolio were worth it. It was beneficial to intrinsic uh, shareholder value uh, per, per share. Uh, I mean, but there's so many implications and considerations of the acquisitions and the market has not been able to digest as well. Yeah, definitely. One of the, one of the things that we really liked about the, how these portfolios complemented ours is that we had already focused our portfolio on higher quality assets with longer life mines, which is, you don't get in a lot of royalty portfolios. There's a lot of smaller royalty companies there portfolios, you know, on average, the mines are six years, seven years, eight years, low quality assets with high costs. And it just so happened that both of these things, uh, the average mine life was decades and the average cost of production was well below average. And so you don't see that very often. And, and it was exactly the type of thing that we wanted to use as a foundation to build a long-term successful company. That's very clear to me, but from the market's point of view, why do you think that that the market has not appreciated the uh, the transactions? Yeah, I think that the market will, given time. Um, as I mentioned before, we've we've had to absorb four hundred million dollars worth of net selling of shares because we had to issue some shares in this transaction. Uh, we issued shares to Glencore. They sold fifty million dollars of shares just a month ago. Um, one of Nomad's shareholders was a company called Yamana. Yamana just got acquired by another company called Pan American and Pan American said, Hey, what are these Sandstorm shares? Why are, why are we on a streaming royalty company? And they just sold $50 million worth of shares about five weeks ago. And so there's been this sort of like continual pressure on our share price. And that is, is virtually done now. It just so unfortunately happened that that was happening during a period of time where I had long COVID and wasn't able to jump on airplanes and go market the company the way I normally would have in the way I'd like to. And, and I'm finally healthy now and 
like I said, just two weeks ago, started jumping on planes and going to London and getting new shareholders. And I'll be in New York, and Toronto next week. And so we've, we've, we've sort of absorbed all of that selling over the last year. And uh, we're going to go find new demand for our shares over the next year. And, and I think that's one thing that people often forget is that share price isn't just based on value. Uh, in, in the long run, it is. In the short run, it's often based on supply demand fundamentals of, of the stock. But, and the truth is there's been supply and, and um, we're now going to go create the demand. These two acquisitions, we kind of touched on this in terms of the investment philosophy at Sandstorm, but did, did you guys kind of have a, a base case NPV that you set out for these two acquisitions, not considering potentially, you know, upside scenarios? What did that figure look like? Yeah, we don't, we don't give out specific NAVs on, you know, befores and afters because, uh, you know, time, time changes things dramatically. But, but I would broad brush answer the question by saying that, that we felt that those, uh, the base core transaction was, was accretive to our nav, but we were buying it a little bit cheaper because there was a little bit more concentration base metals and they typically trade less. And the way we approached Nomad is we said, we're trading at a low PNA multiple, you're trading at a low PNA multiple. Let's pick a share exchange ratio that's about nav neutral to your shareholders and nav neutral to our shareholders. But we think the portfolio looks better together and there's more diversification and it's stronger together. And uh, it's just a better company. And, and that was the basis on which we picked that valuation. So in terms of the shareholders from um, that you acquired from uh, uh, Nomad, do you see selling stopping now or do you see that continuing? Yeah, all the major uh, strategic sellers that we think um, have a potential to shell in the near term, they, they all literally just all sold in the last uh, couple of months. And so um, what we have seen is a couple of their smaller institutional shareholders who only own so much of them because of their size, they've actually started buying as well. So. Uh, I can't name names, but we've got about four or five large, very, very large institutional investors who have started picking away slowly and quietly at Sandstorm share price. And these aren't guys that just buy 1% of a company at a time. They, you know, they can buy several percent of a company. So I think we've got a bit of a, a longer term bid. They're just, you know, they're not trying to drive our share price up while they buy. They're just trying to slowly, quietly build their positions. In the final segment, we will cover Sandstorm's financial position, their capital allocation strategy, as well as their position in the competitive landscape. What is the mandate for the foreseeable future in terms of funding new investments or acquisitions? Will you be avoiding increasing debt? Is that like a, you, you, you won't increase debt and or issuing equity? What's your you know, mandate on that? Yeah, I kind of alluded to it in the presentation, but really the growth strategy right now is number one, just let the portfolio mature. I mean, a lot of our, our peer companies have shrinking production profiles if they don't go out there and buy things. We can sit on our hands, do absolutely nothing, make no acquisitions, and our growth profile is, going to, growth profile is just going to keep growing up over the next four or five years. And, uh, and we have that because we just bought a bunch of things and we paid for some of that with debt. So our plan is just pay the debt down. Um, we don't plan on being heroes and buying a bunch of big things over the next year. I think it's going to be boring as the new sexy for Sandstorm for a theme. And, and that's the plan. If along comes Glencore, they say, hey, we'd like you to exercise your Mara stream option. We'll do that. Fortunately, on that one, we don't have to pay all up front. We pay as they build the mine. And that would be about a three-year mine life build. So we just sort of pay that over time. And, and that's the plan. If we we're, we're looking at longer dated deals with Horizon, and if we find something, we'll we'll do that then. But there's there's nothing imminent on that front right now. Okay, so that that repayment that's first. Secondarily, you will have inorganic. You say organic growth that's within the portfolio already. So inorganic growth. Are, are you looking to potentially you know increasing direct uh, returns to shareholders once the debt has been paid down significantly? Well, we, we have a dividend in place and we're going to, we'll keep that in place and, and we won't, we won't touch that right now. Um, if we ever do touch it, it'll be to increase it. But right now we prioritize debt repayment rather than increasing the dividend. Our share price has gotten to a, a very, very 
silly low level here after that hundred million dollars worth of selling over the last five weeks um, by between uh, those other companies. And so we've actually been buying back shares. In fact, I think in the last three weeks we bought back two million of our own our own shares. So uh, we are prioritizing debt repayment. But on you know you wake up and your share price is a crazy low number, we'll we'll buy back shares. And then I just wanted to um, allow everyone to understand the financial position a bit better. You have, um, uh, you mentioned that you have these loans to mining companies. When do these loans mature? And when do you expect to be repaid in full amount? $245 million, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so we've got a loan out to a number of different mining companies. Some are companies that we did deals with where we bought a stream and lent them some money at the same time. Some in the cases like Horizon where we gave them the Antamina royalty and they paid with an IOU and with the silver streams that IOU was effectively a loan. And that loan has a cash sweep on it. So whatever additional royalty revenue that Horizon gets, they have to hand it over to Sandstorm um, to repay that loan. So that'll, that'll bolster the cash flow as well. And so, yes, we have $460 million of debt, but we have $300 million of assets, investments out to two mining companies that are generating a yield themselves. The actual debt net of those assets is, is not that high. And then uh, I wanted to, to touch on as well, what will your approach towards inorganic growth be in the, in the coming few years, new transactions? Will you, you know, reduce the size a little less frequent? If I read between the lines, you're going to repay that, you know, what stage of development are you looking for? You know, commodities, you're focusing gold. Yeah. So looking for things that are in production, mostly, um, sometimes looking for high, high quality development assets, but not, we're not looking at anything early stage. Um, we are looking for bigger things, but like you said, very infrequent. I, I wouldn't expect a big transaction out of us in the next year, even. Um, we're going to let the portfolio mature, let a lot of the things we bought get developed and come online, um, get our revolving line of credit recharged is the way I think about it. So when, when I mentioned that we have debt, the actual form of that debt is in a revolving line of credit. Kind of think of it like a, a corporate credit card, if you will. So we have a $625 million line of credit. We've only drawn on it to the tune of $460 million. So we've got $160 million of available credit on that line if we wanted to grow. Um, and if we are looking at acquiring things that have their own um, debt capacity because the mine's already up and running and operating, we could relook at the size of that, that line of credit. So right now we're just focused on pay that line of credit down to zero. And then we have $625 million available on our acquisition credit card, if you will. And in terms of being able to pay down that debt, I mean, how aggressive are we talking? What kind of makes sense? Because of course it should be a balance too. Yeah, well, we're, it's impossible to predict uh, how we're going to allocate capital. But right now I would say we're focused on debt repayment. Um, we're going to keep paying our dividend. If our share price goes low, we're going to buy back our shares. And if we find an amazing acquisition, we'll look at how we're going to do that in the context of where we are at that time. Um, it, it's impossible to tell what acquisition opportunities will become real for us and what their sizes are. So it's impossible for me to predict how, how we would finance that. Or if we didn't want to do it because we just wanted to prioritize paying down debt, then we might pass on it. I think it would be very reassuring for a lot of retail investors to hear that you guys are slowing down a bit because I think some people were kind of scared a bit when you guys went very quick last year. So uh, I think that would be very well received. No, that's definitely, that's definitely the message. It's like I said, it's not exciting, but for us it's kind of boring is the new sexy. <laughs> what does the current market environment look like in terms of, you know, the potential for acquiring new royalties uh, in the coming 12 months? Yeah, I think there it's good. Generally speaking, um, we're, unless it's a really, really good opportunity with lots of expiration upside, we don't plan on being too active. I think you'll see uh, a number of our peers, they've got shrinking production profiles over the next number of years. And so I think you'll see them competing really hard head to head for some of those transactions. And we're gonna stick to our knitting, let those mines uh, grow and develop that, that we've already owned. Uh, like I said, look at the Mara stream if, option if that's given to us. And then if we find something with Horizon, great. And, and that's it. So you mentioned the competitive landscape there. So what do you expect to take place in the royalties and stream competitive landscape in the coming few years? 
Yeah, that, that's an interesting one there. <clears throat> if you look over the last year, sort of, there were sort of six mid tiers, you know, Sandstorm, Triple Flag, Cisco, and then you had Mavericks, Nomad, and Basecore. And we bought Nomad and Basecore, and Triple Flag bought Mavericks. And so half of the mid caps just disappeared over the last year. So the competitive landscape has decreased through that consolidation. Um, and there really is almost nothing interesting between those three mid caps all the way down to companies that are a couple hundred million dollars in market cap that don't have any free cash flow. So there's really nothing interesting left for the mid caps to buy. So if, if, if anyone's wondering if they're going to wake up and see Sandstorm having acquired another streaming royalty company the next year, absolutely not. There's nothing that's interesting to us. Um, I do think that the mid tiers, uh, it does make sense for some consolidation amongst us with even if it's just mergers of equals, but, um, you know, relative valuations have to make sense. Sandstorm trading at a huge discount right now to the other, other two mid tiers. So it doesn't make uh, sense for us on that basis at the moment, but it's something that we're absolutely open to if creating a, a better, bigger, more liquid, more diversified company going forward. Well, we're willing to have those conversations. You, you emphasize that you are, by quite quite some extent, the highest quality portfolio company. So would you demand some kind of premium for that? Do, don't you think it would be quite difficult to convince these companies to kind of step down a bit in, in their NAV calculations with that in mind, if you do a merger, let's say, with a mid-term peer? Yeah, I've sort of spent my entire career in various phases in very M&A focused companies and, and done transactions. I know uh, these things are hard all the time. Um, but they can get done at times. And so I, I don't know how the futures can unfold, but I do think there is a, a basis for putting some of those companies together and it might happen, it might not. If you were to merge it, you will, the team, the Sandstorm team will be maintaining that new entity or what do you suspect? No, we don't, we don't know. I think, I think if, if two companies merge, you sort of figure out who, what the best new team um, looks like. I think one thing that, that has disappointed me over the years watching public companies behave is that CEOs in particular tend to uh, love their jobs so much they never are willing to do a merger or acquisition if they're not the, the surviving CEO and they put themselves ahead of their shareholders. You know, like I said, uh, you know, if I can get Sandstrom share price up one more dollar, that's worth 20 years of my salary. So you know, I'm not sitting there protecting my job, if you will. And uh, then finally, we always like to ask companies um, on a five-year horizon, where do you envision Sandstorm being from now? Yeah, five, I'm really excited about Sandstorm on a five-year basis because five years from now, we'll, we'll have all of those assets that we talked about developed in production. We'll have huge amounts of cash flow. We'll have a totally uh, rebuilt uh, balance sheet with virtually no debt. And uh, the world's our oyster for the next leg of growth. Um, I, I think in the next five years, it's conceivable for us to acquire another billion dollars uh, worth of things based on what our, our cash flow is going to be and what our balance sheet will be able to take care of. And, and we're going to build a, a real big, so we're, we're trying to become the next the next one of the majors. And so five years is, is a great timeline. I'm, I'm excited. All right, Nolan, it was great speaking to you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.